So welcome to the 15th, right, 15th, yeah, <laughs> annual Florida State Religion Department or Department of Religion Graduate Student Symposium. Um, I'm Andy McKee. I'm the one who's been sending you all very harassing emails for the last several months. So thank you for showing up still after all that. Um, I want to welcome you to Florida State. Uh, for a great talk tonight, a great weekend. I'm super excited about everything that's gonna happen this weekend. Um, I just wanna give a couple thank yous to people who have uh, worked very hard with me on this. Uh, Matt Costin is not here. He has a one month old baby, but uh, he co-directed with me through all of that, and so that's been very nice of him, uh, along with his wife, Holly, who I think they're gonna show up later, so hopefully you can say hello to them. Uh, I also wanna give uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Matthew Goff and Dr. Calbian, wherever she is. Oh, hi. Uh, for signing lots of papers for me, along with John Bridges and Susan Stetson, our uh, office secretaries and managers. Um, it's my privilege to introduce not only Dr. Katie Lofton tonight for this talk, but also Dr. Finbar Curtis, Dr. Sarah Dees, Dr. John Modern, Dr. Richard Callahan, and I guess Dr. Corrigan, if we're going to get ducks in a row. Uh, to, <laughs> no, just to Florida State as well. Uh, we'll be doing a round table tomorrow night at six o'clock, so stick around after all the panel fun that you've had tomorrow. Uh, and we'll also have a reception tomorrow night. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Katie Lofton, uh, who wrote a book about Oprah or something, uh, for a talk on the status of celebrity, celebrity in the study of religion. Thank you. Have fun. Totally, uh, I've been made a mess by this event. Um, I've been made a mess by it because, first of all, I, I, we do think we have to applaud again for Andy because he is so spectacular at lassoing us all to our ladies. So I've been a mess because I can't figure out genre, which is usually something I think I'm so good at, and I'm not this night. Here's why I got caught into a vortex. The vortex was that I have been here a couple times for this conference <laughs> as, a, as a, just a total groupie. And, um, and I always felt Friday night was hard because really you just want to go start drinking. And <laughs> some of you already have. And, um, and then I added to that. So then I added to that layer that there were going to be all these resplendent Americanists in the house, which is very stressful. Because uh, usually I mouth off at these kinds of events and I'm really the only Americanist. And then I can say whatever I want. So then that got me to this weird place where I decided to get mad at one particular Americanist in my talk, which I do. Okay, so that's one. So Friday night, maybe we'll have a little fun, get done quick. Bunch of Americanists, let's get mad at an insider buddy. Then, third problem. Camille Kafka's here, and that's like a lot for me. Because if there is a celebrity in the study of religion, as Elaine just observed, it is Camilla, and a person who has sustain my soul in ways she does not know with recipes and a son that gives us all greatness every day. So, so this is hard. So it's weird what I'm about to do. It's legit weird. Guys, there's a hundred PowerPoint slides. So, um, <laughs> but they go by fast. <laughs> I want to begin with a relatively neutral observation about a person. <laughs> 20th century, it's really not funny the whole time, so like don't build yourselves up. <laughs> like it's sad in the middle and I'm mad at the end. Anyway, <laughs> 20th century American evangelist, Billy Graham was not a listener. The less neutral description would be to say that Billy was not a good listener. But we'll take a minute before we hustle to condemnation. Using only data in Grant Wacker's biography of Billy Graham, we can simply observe that Billy was not someone who listened who needed to listen or wanted to listen as a practice of his professional life. Never once in a 400 page biography do we hear of a single moment when Billy listened to anyone. We hear instead about how well and how much he spoke at them. For those who loved, love Billy, this might seem an undue criticism. For his acolytes, Billy Graham was meaningful because he connected to them. In Wacker's words, this meant that Graham knew how to speak both for and to ordinary Americans with consummate skill. Wacker doesn't pretend that Graham spoke with ordinary Americans. He assumes only that they must that he spoke for them and to them, since so many kept listening. And to be clear, they did. 
By the time he retired from the road in 2005, Graham had preached to nearly 215 million people in person in 99 countries and perhaps to another 2 billion through live closed circuit telecasts. Such a tally suggests that he spoke to a lot of people. Did he speak for them? In 1973, on an airport tarmac in Seoul, South Korea, Graham preached to more than 1.1 million people, delivering the good news to what has been referred to as the largest gatherings of humans for a religious purpose in all of history. In a 1978 Ladies Home Journal survey, under the category Achievement in Religion, the preacher outstripped everyone except God. <laughs> Do figures of such appeal necessarily speak for those who come to hear them? And can we ever know, one way or another, if they do? My talk today is on the status of celebrity as a subject for the study of religion. And I will give you the conclusion at the outset that despite my deep involvement in the subject area, the status is not good. I use Grant Wacker's recent biography of Billy Graham as a stand-in for the problem I seek to explore. I think the reason we're not good at talking about celebrity is the same reason the study of religion has, it seems, lost no small amount of its swagger, namely because we don't understand our relationship to critique. We've become so absorbed by the labor of thick description that we can't figure out why we decide to study what we're describing and what that decision has to do with anything other than coloring one corner of a predetermined intellectual map of the world. In the last two years of job searches I have conducted, I asked every candidate who comes to sit before me in that awkward meeting with a chair, why do you select to analyze the documentary archive you have designated as yours? What question do you answer through this analysis? I tell you all these questions so perhaps when you come before me you can do better than every single person who has come to that um, It staggers me the silence I receive in reply, as if I've asked them to strip off their clothes or perhaps to speak in Sanskrit. Eventually they will stumble and say something like, because it's a body of materials that my field studies, or to find out how humans are more complicated than we think. And I want to say, I do not blame the candidates for the stuttering. I blame their commodification. Something about our most basic decisions as humanists has gotten lost on the way to securing work as humanists. Work that we know, we all know, for unfortunate, uncertain, is anything but secure. And our administrations ask us over and over, why do the texts you choose matter? Why do you think your analysis of them will offer any analysis worth us knowing and paying for? Scholarship on celebrity assumes that celebrities matter because they're famous, and that their analysis of them will explain why they are famous. Despite being a vicious tautology, this is also a pair of inquiries that nobody seems able to satisfy. Today, I want to try to think about how critique functions in the labor of close reading celebrity. Celebrities in the form of a particular religious leadership, celebrity as a form of iconography. My archive is scholarship on celebrity, as well as iconic images to which this scholarship repeatedly refers. I choose this archive specifically because it is weak. And it is about subjects that we think and indeed treat as if they are throwaway but we can't altogether throw them away. So in this sense, I suggest that celebrity studies occupies a role not unlike Geniza, a place where things are tossed when we lose interest or they wear out, whether it's Britney Spears or Selena Gomez, a place that stores things we might imagine could be more valuable than garbage, if only because we have an undefinable relationship to the deity we sketch briefly upon their bodies, if only to forget it once they turn 23. In, in scholarship on contemporary media cultures, the celebrity is repeatedly described as a commodity. In particular, the celebrity is a media effect, reliant upon the acquisition and publicity of that individual's private life. I want to highlight that as a violence, this violent transformation from human to celebrity. We should pause on it even though it's axiomatic. Transforming flesh into commodity has a very long history, a history that includes far less voluntary formats of commodification than those experienced by Justin Bieber or Brad Pitt. 
Invoking prior practices of human trade may beg differentiation from the elective auditions and self-making of modern celebrity. But to make what is human something that is marketable, to convert from raw material, maybe a girl born on a Christmas farm, to a consumer good, the album titled with your birth year, is undeniably a procedure of atomization, valuation, and dehumanization. Anatomizing the processes by which this modus operandi transpires should be, of course, a focal point of academic research, if only because we know that we are all part of such processes now, all of us. What it is to become professionalized in the 21st century is not so very distinct from what it means to become commodified. In the realm of celebrity, such investigations will find that there is always a historic fact or incident that compels the procedure to begin. A celebrity could emerge from a single video, an episode, and a performing incident. The celebrity is then confirmed and perpetuated through the parsing of the ineffable wonder of that moment, the performer's incomparable talent or uncanny timing. A star is born but then sustain her celebrity, her gifts, such as they might be, will be chopped and repackaged into capitalizing cover shoots, singular accessories, or transcendent features, a particular dance move, a growl, a mole. The overlap here between the characters celebrities play and the characters of their publicized private lives is often quite difficult to differentiate. What began as some person becomes a storyline in which the character of the performance is deployed to interpret the character of the person, and vice versa. Meanwhile, the converted human also becomes a composite sketch with parts and pieces and accessories easily redacted and repackaged, remembered, and satirized. The celebrity may repeatedly fight to deny that they have undergone such a conversion, that they are, to borrow from an Us Weekly idiom, just like us, here being the three most recent posted that I could find quickly today. The repeated construction of that quotidian humanity is a necessary component of their ongoing commodification as an object of glamour, of exclusive talent, and of outsized personal drama. Claims of accessibility only underline just how remote they have become. It's so interesting. He reads the paper. What then is the relationship between this process and the terms of religion? Writing about late Roman society, quite famously, Peter Brown remarked that the holy man was deliberately not human. In a consumer society, the transformation of men and women into celebrities has inspired some scholars to remark upon the divinity of celebrities themselves. This suggests that in American culture, the celebrity functions as a component of a pantheon that exists to dramatize social concerns, endorse certain forms of normative behavior. Drawing such quick lines, though, between the gods of Greece and the stars on Hollywood Boulevard is less rigorous than what the complexity of celebrity and their consumption demand, however. Any connections made should be first considered in a very specific research territory. We could cast Angelina Jolie as some kind of queenly goddess, and we could therefore fall into the pursuit of celebrity as a kind of religion. You'll note here um, the piece specifically quotes Walmart and the aesthetic on the bottom. In such set of studies, we could examine consumer behavior around celebrity consumption. We could read tabloids and see the reading of those tabloids as a ritual activity, or think about the upcoming Oscar parties you have as annual events in your liturgical secular calendar. All of this is to mark the ways that celebrities have become invocations of certain problems and also occasions to celebrate, places for ritual practice, moral commentary, and identity development in ways correlate to religious behavior. There have already been several excellent and quite precise reviews of Grant Wacker's biography of Billy Graham. Not one review of America's pastor has failed to describe how disciplined and fair-minded the biographer was in his craft, nor has anyone questioned the epical omnipresence of Billy himself. These reviews capture well the way that Wacker directs us to appraise Billy Graham as a man of his time. And they praise Wacker appropriately for the care he takes in his archival assemblage and his narrative clarity. 
Indeed, I don't think there is much more to actually say about describing the content of the academic biography other than to turn to the subject as posed by Wacker, so well recounted, and wonder at how he, Billy Graham, became someone for so many. Given the facts, the answer is hardly apparent. A great pastor he was not, Wacker observes, reflecting on Graham's early years at a CMA tabernacle. Later in a chapter, Wacker devotes a lot more attention to what individuals wrote in letters to Graham. He reiterates this appraisal, that pastoral office played the least important part of his story. Why then does Wacker actually title his book America's Pastor? In the many manuscript pages between these two grim assessments of Graham's non-existent commitment to the intimate labor of ministerial life, Wacker works to organize the epic nature of Graham's life into thematic chapters that expose how a relatively uninteresting boy of middle class means with a limited theological range became, yes indeed, in one of my favorite phrasings, the Pope of Lower Protestantism. <laughs> student of evangelicalism, there are many, this is not Wacker's words, there are many, for any student of evangelicalism, there are a lot of familiar tropes to the Billy biography. The early discovery of his prodigal talents, the rapid ascendancy following signal crusades in major urban areas, the strategic use of his very thin Protestant message as a counter-programming to the various cultural threats of his times, and the sappy, savvy, savvy, not sappy, but also sappy, supervision by his business arm, the Billy Graham Evangel Evangelistic Association, to manage the transmedia permeation of his person in your world. The sawdust trail is strewn with the specters of young men seeking renown through the spectacular circulation of their physicality as a message for your redemption. In a study of US history, the connection between Protestantism and the economic, political, and cultural logic of secularism is now quite well established. Well established in just a couple books that might be present in this room. <laughs> I commander Porter's conceived in death. John, I'm not gonna say that my life. What these histories explain is how integral Christianity is to our self-organization as workers, political actors, tinkerers, and ideologues in the United States. Christianity is the ruler and the frame, the formatting even for a most resistant countercultural action. It will be there before you can imagine you can resist it. It defines even your resistance as you build a mosque. This could be seen as something far away, out there in the recesses of revival tents and coal mines, if it weren't clear that all of our suppositions about all authority and leadership are very, very deeply tied to the simplifying hegemonic modalities of Protestantism. To be clear, none of the authors I have just cited would be so quick to call these simple hegemonic. I'm mad at Wacker, so that's how I'm talking tonight. I am reaching for that vocabulary because I am increasingly interested in the difficulties facing leaders of all stripe, religious and not, in this, an era that seems to exhibit the Protestant dream of mediated permeability, airwaves open, all messages ready to be heard from all saints. So I want to think about what it means to lead in such a time. I want to think in particular if there isn't one particular historical reason that makes leadership today so much harder than before. And that is what I want to call the new erotic ex expectation. The accessibility of individual self-promotion and then the resultant pervasive commodification of your individuality has led us to develop whole new sets of hopes and expectations for what we think leaders should be able to do for us. We think they should be able to be leaders and also signify leadership, to be icons of whatever they lead. And if I have a driving purpose tonight, it is to underline that that is impossible, that real leadership cannot also be iconic of leadership. Real leadership is brutish and quiet, humble and discreet. And what in the world can be that in this world? I run ahead of myself. What I want to underline is that I have been thinking a lot about leading and about the related images of image and estimation. In my home institution, there is a major revision ongoing of the decanal structure, one that reflects a lot of other institutions of higher education. And in the process of negotiating that, we also have a widely expanding administrative class of employees in an institution with a long history of faculty governance. 
Conversations about who should hold these positions in my local context inevitably lead to very hard appraisals of predecessors. Hard talk about specific bureaucratic and charismatic failing. Everyone in this room has worked professionally in any context knows this kind, or just watched The Office, starring <laughs> Steve Carell, knows this grousing institutional talk. The way that, if you think about The, the Office, how many seasons were just obsessed with finding a replacement for Michael? Like, it was just, there was like a whole season where they were trotting in different people. There is such a vast vocabulary of criticism that we possess when we talk about our bosses. Criticism that links specific aspects of personality with specific failures of management. We transform a live wire, a real mind, a human person, a once upon departmental colleague into a kind of topic, not exactly celebrity, no one's getting free shoes, but something more akin to an abstraction, an object to circulate. This transformation of the embodied material facts of a thing of a person into a spiritual appraisal of them is not new in the history of humanity. But we live in an era when a certain physical discipline is the very least you must achieve if you seek to survive public appraisal of your person. Everybody seems to have developed an incredibly acute skill for redaction, self-summary, and branding. Or if you don't, or if you do, but your seams show a little too much, you're judged over-eager, too needy, wanting it all too much. Does it go without saying that this is racialized and gendered? Perhaps no celebrity better epitomizes the centrality of physical embodiment and the weird balance between over-eager and just always game than the very body and person of Kim Kardashian. Outcries over the Vogue cover that she had with her and her then fiance Kanye West, together known as Kim Ye, demonstrate that the public is contradictory about its relationship to the vacuity of image. We want our public figures to be idealized embodiments, but we don't want them to have to become our public figures merely because of their embodiments. We want something else, something more, always. Some concept of substance lingering beneath the representation of style. Vogue readers prefer, they complain subsequently, the nameless high fashion model to Kim Kardashian because Kardashian has made the mistake of confusing her forms of embodiment as analogous to theirs. What readers of Vogue wanted her to know is that she should know her place. Kardashian did, of course, the impossible. She, who looks a little bit like a model, a little bit like a figurine, and a tiny bit like us, has confused the iconic space, provoking outcries that sound a little bit like iconoclasts of yore. Sally Promi and David Morgan have explained as a strategy, iconoclasm transforms icons into idols and seeks to break the spell the idol has over consciousness. And so the critics of Kimye cover, of the Kimye cover, want to keep it from being iconic and remind anyone who likes it that they've become idol worshippers, suckered by presence that lacks true spirit. There is something about Kanye West and Kim Kardashian that makes people feel that they, Kim Ye, just don't get it. As if they can't stop mortifying themselves before us with their excess. Their excess materiality, their excess exposure, their excesses of speech. Critics of this particular cover perceived a failure of brand control by Vogue, especially Anna Wintour, who should have known better than to contradict her imperious stylistic hierarchy with such low, low idols. Yet the public stands in contradiction, since they also perceive that they, the readers, don't just get it, get the conception of Kimye, which seems impossible, since, as perhaps many of you know, this was the highest selling issue of Vogue in 10 years. There is evermore, evermore images of Kim, albums by Kanye, tweets from Kanye, new live feeds from Kim, Quotations from either the fill the space, the break in your lunch hour, the soundtrack of your commute, the late night TV wasteland. Kimye are fit for our binge culture that likes nothing more than humans, once flesh, made object for us. What they make, we don't stop consuming. Their noise seems to be part of the problem and they're the solution to it. They are the excess mediation of our time. They are the embarrassment of our time. They are the triumph of this time. 
In early Christian traditions, icons were visual representations of the religious figure, either two-dimension painting or three-dimensional sculptures. In order to be avoid described as idolatry, as some in the room know from their doctoral exams, icons were understood to be necessarily hollow. So the early Christian icons were understood to be mere points, redirecting the focus of the viewer toward that which was signified, whether Jesus, Mary, Saint. The problem with Kimye is that they don't seem to make it really easy to redirect yourself from them. If their heroic parallel, that of Beyonce and Jay-Z, represent hard work or black royalty, or uh, thinking about a great paper I just uh, heard in the last panel um, about Timothy, uh, give it, about black capitalism, which I think there'd be kind of, the, if Jay-Z and Booker T. Washington, they could have talked for hours <laughs> late tonight. <laughs> so what we see is that, that their iconicity, that is that of Kimye, seems to point at the signification of their very excess of availability. So they are, in the sense, icons of a media that can't stop eating. This foray into Kimye serves only to underline what our standards for iconicity are or seem to be. This may seem as if I wandered somewhat far afield from the problem of leadership, but I want to dig into the subtle ways we differentiate between Kimye and other types of icons, what we expect from iconography, and how in our time this poses real problems to what it means to be in community. How can you be substantial when you have two media effects tugging upon you? On one side, the scrupulosity police tugging on your every false move for its self-contradiction, idiocy, or accused bad politics. On the other, the call of the hungry hordes, where are your enrollments, asking you to communicate, to give, to communicate, to offer, to Instagram, to Twitter, to feed them, give them, be there for them. We are expected to offer more transparency than ever before. We are expected to be better, smoother, more hairless, more perfect, more knowledgeable than ever before. What is a humble leader to do? Billy Graham's story is special only because everyone seems to think of it as an apogee of evangelical celebrity. Wacker is especially interested in the incredible fame that Graham achieved, a fame based largely on a relentless circulation of his particular embodiment of the preacher. Graham didn't make anything. He embodied and expressed a very familiar story, one that was in many ways became secondary to his sheer presence. In his attempt to try to capture this erratic fact of, Graham, of, of Billy Graham, Wacker reaches at one point for two stunning analogies which he mulls upon for some time, that of Martin Luther King and Pope John Paul II. Analogies which are to me so incommensurate as to fail quickly upon closer scrutiny and were absolutely torn apart in her wonderful review of the book. Molly Worthen wrote an excellent review of the book in The Nation. More appropriate to me are figures that Wacker also nominates, that of Colonel Sanders and Andy Griffith, both of whom <laughs> Wacker cheerfully invokes. What Billy, Colonel Sanders, and Andy have in common, Wacker explains, is that they all represent an acceptable form of Southern the one who doesn't remind you of segregation as much as they remind you of, you of kind of banal white pleasures like fried chicken buckets and aw shucks morality with unlocked jail cells and cooking as the transom of affection. Taking Wacker's observation to a slightly darker place, another Graham biographer, the wonderful Marshall Frady, suggested that Graham sought to transform and pasteurize the whole world into a Sunday afternoon in Charlotte. <laughs> if you've never been to Charlotte, you can't enjoy that as much as you can if you've been there. All blessings. What strikes any non-evangelical reader is the way that these analogies pull us pretty quickly from the obvious achievements in religion to other franchise locations in the pop scene. Wacker doesn't ever consider Graham alongside other middle-brow religious sensations of his long public life. We never hear about Graham as he could compare to Joshua Liebman or Jack Kornfield or Louis Farrakhan. Instead, we hear about Graham relative to a pope, a civil rights martyr, an American businessman, and a sitcom star. This is because Graham is bigger than those laboring, low-level stars of strictly denominational acclaim, or the sex it assumes. He is someone, Billy Graham, who isn't just a preacher. He's a celebrity. Wacker knows that Graham emerges in a moment of nascent celebrity culture. That's the mid-20th century. And he doesn't seem to recall that this word celebrity appeared initially as a very caustic term that encapsulated significant annoyance with mass culture and its effects. 
In the mid-20th century, Daniel Borston Riley described the celebrity as a manufactured person. This was not a compliment. The rapidity with which a person can become a household word overnight was what defined celebrity for Borston and distinguished celebrities from other kinds of figures on the landscape. As Borston observed, the celebrity is born in the daily paper and never loses the mark of his fleeting origin. Borston's greatest frustration is not that that person exists, but that believers mistake this rush of interest, this clamoring for the name, the face, the voice, the personage, with meaningful connection. It's one thing to be vaguely interested in a celebrity. It's another thing altogether to attach to them any kind of value. And for Borston, celebrities have no other value than their circulation. In his famous locution, the celebrity is a person who is well known for his well knownness. The test of celebrity is nothing more than well knownness. To go on at further length, of course we do not like to believe that our admiration is focused on a largely synthetic product. Having manufactured our celebrities, having willy-nilly made them our sinishers, the guiding stars of our interest, we are tempted to believe that they are not synthetic at all, that they are somehow still God-made heroes who now abound with a marvelous modern prodigality. To be clear then, for Borston, we make a fatal category error when we attribute substance to someone who is known for being known. We think that this renown is enough to become an ability we're celebrating with further attention. But this marvelous modern prodigality is a mere projection of their celebrity presence. For Borston, there would have been no question about it. Graham does not speak for you. You've just made him be the one you want. You've made him be the one that you want to see. This is a harsh view, and maybe not the one that we want to settle at as our moment in the study of religion. This is so mid-20th century. They're so angry at everything, especially things made for the people. Wacker doesn't shy away from admitting just how much he loves Billy and how much he loved the fact that people love watching Billy, seeing him, and also just wanting to see more of him. I have never read a biography so transfixed by the appearance of its subject as Wacker's. A compulsion perhaps justifiable as a reflection of the broader documentary interest in Billy's attractiveness, not my language. As Wacker says, for the better part of 60 years, virtually every, this is, this is Wacker remarking on the archive, virtually every newspaper paper article about Graham commented on his appearance. Wacker never asks what makes Billy attractive. He just takes his handsomeness as axiomatic. After all, Billy is white. He is tall. He has no blemishes and no disabilities. This is just the start. If good looks and smart attire provided the base, Graham's manifest easiness in his own skin materialized on televisions and even behind stadium pulpits as old-fashioned Southern charm. On talk shows in particular, he came across as dashingly photogenic. He proved a lively guest, blessed with a quick smile, ready quip, and easygoing banter. He often said things in all settings he sought in one way or another to present the gospel. It was a remarkable, even an instinctive balancing act, a serious message lightly delivered. Graham complimented this stunningly beige public personality with a character that similarly lacked any chicanery. Wacker says over and over that Graham represented a man of uncompromised sincerity, and he uses this as evidence, the fact that Graham apparently committed no adultery, mismanaged no money, and had no major beef with any contemporaneous preachers. For being a baseline, inoffensive guy who was nonetheless the evangelical kingpin of his long life, one biographer called Graham America's most complicated innocent, and another historian observed he is the least colorful and most powerful preacher in America. I noted that you can't lead and be an icon. Leadership requires a certain kind of self-abnegation that is impossible to do if you're already articulate as or through the iconic frame. But there may be some lessons icons can teach leaders, which could be usable in our present life. So let's think a little bit more about what icons can do in an effort to figure out how laboring leaders might survive this era of icon making and deconstructing. To begin, if you want to become an icon, you have to stop speaking and let other people do the talking. This is very hard for people who are religious leaders to do. Indeed, very few religious leaders become icons, even though many icons become religious objects for their followers. This may not seem right to you, since you're probably thinking of people like Jesus or Buddha, both of whom are religious leaders and both of whom became icons. But the leaders I am referring to are much more parochial, with few of them becoming memorable. 
This doesn't mean that they don't talk. But if I asked you to name a leader you yourself admired, a person you would believe in and interact with and resist with happiness because it made you better, you wouldn't recognize them probably automatically from a photo. You'd likely say to some oddball dean or some weird local principal of your kid's school, someone who worked and talked with us all the time but never rose to the level even close of being iconic. This would distance them from the pastoral work that is almost always definitive of what decent leading includes. Icons are necessarily for us muted. A component of their role-specific expectations, they don't do anything exactly. They just do what we tell them to do. As Robert Bonier explained in an essay he published in Material Religion, the icon has traveled far from its art historical definition as a panel painting of a holy figure or a sculpture from the Eastern Orthodox tradition. So now the more widespread use of iconic draws on this other aspect of the material object. It's focused on its cultural role and its high status. To refer to, as Maniera puts it, culturally salient people, things, concepts, sports people, musicians, commercial products, and brands. We all know this, of course. This language is tossed around easily, the culturally salient things. They can be everything from things like people who began to represent ideas, like Robert E. Lee, the icon of the Confederacy, or Friedrich Nietzsche, icon of thought, philosophy, existentialism, madness, weirdness. Icons can be companies which transcended the economic odds, as, such as the Rome Corporation in the 70s, or Ford Motor Company over the last five years, or paintings which transcend centuries, and works of art or architecture whose sheer outline are instantly recognizable to the eye. Cultures can have icons. Individual clothing items can be iconic. We can also, all of these objects and items, share some sense that their very figuration conveys the total fact of their invocation. Ford Motor Company is now the comeback kid. Japanese swords are the feudal history of Japan. Jeans are the universal garment. The icon is almost always an icon of something, as in icons of life, a cultural history of human embryos. An icon is the portal to the complex whole, a transom from reality into its heightened maximal articulation. I am trying to press at Billy here, to doubt first whether he could be understood substantively as a religious leader, and second whether he is something more like an icon. To know, we have to know more about what he actually did, though, and whether or not he was doing the things that I just described are possible for icons. Silent, usable. What was it that Billy Graham did in front of all those people? We hear that they, he gave a lot of sermons. In general, his sermons were about 40 minutes apiece. We hear from Wacker that the sermons were given in a strong voice, with fast delivery, using simple words and abundant physical bombast. We also hear that they were filled with a lot of bad jokes, inaccurate facts, and this is Wacker's language, preposterous versions of scriptural texts, supplied never with any theological rumination. With those limits to Billy's sermonic content, why did we listen to him? Why do we choose to listen to a man who listened so poorly to us? The strongest case Wacker makes is one more implied than argued. Wacker suggests that Billy's persuasive power is his confidence. And that maybe what everyone can't stop enjoying when they're watching Billy is just how confident he is, despite how terrible he is. <laughs> Wacker portrays Billy as someone who tells bad jokes, doesn't have the facts, has a loud voice, is handsome. But the most important thing he reiterates is how confident he was in everything. He offered a series of very simple theological ideas, very confidently. Here are those ideas. That you only need one text to understand all things. That this text is very clear. That Jesus was sinless, and he paid for our sins. That if you repented, you'd have a better life. And that life everlasting would be better than this life. And, most of all, he repeatedly expressed the idea that Christians could be confident that Christ would return at the end of human history. This is a bundle of news offered as the good news. Many people, professional nerds and everyday readers, could reasonably contest the clarity of these points. Those outside the language games of Christianity could get caught up in what the death of one person has to do with the redemption of others. 
Those who first encountered the Bible, even if it's just Billy's preferred living Bible, could disagree strongly with characterizing that as a simple document. Moreover, we could resist in total the idea that any of this is actually good news. That it is good to rely on one book, one son, or one future in the conceptualization of our life's purpose. Love for Graham was in part love for and desire for his confidence that the good could be so simple. Billy may have performed a spiritual humility, but he swaggered in this message. He acted as if he knew what it was to know anything. And this is what he sold. Confidence that whatever Cold War hijinks triggered our anxieties, that whatever individual sin tugged at our hearts, it would all work out, as he would say, eventually. God dreams bigger dreams than you can in this life. This was a resolutely redacted idea of human survival, one resistant to any substantive idea of history and any notion of human diversity. For much of his career, Billy had a daily syndicated newspaper column titled My Answer, which he would eventually compile into volumes, in which he addressed a wide array of human problems ostensibly written to him by parishioners. This is the only source of data that Wacker has recourse to to think about his interactions with other people. These questions and answers bore no dates. The reason? Graham based his answers in the Bible, and the Bible was timeless and universal. In a later compendium of these columns, Billy wrote, the word of our God stands forever as an unchanging source of answers to all of life's problems. Human life, however distinct from Billy's life, was not to be treated diversely. The answers to all questions were the same answers. The answers taken from a text that he said gave all the answers the same. Perhaps this is why it didn't really matter to Graham or to his readers that he didn't really write these columns. He later told a reporter that a man helped him with it because he was so often on the road. The truth is the truth, no matter the vessel. Of course, this isn't quite true. The vessel is very particular. It's white and tall without blemish and no disability. David Morgan has written extensively about icons and their power within visual culture. He writes that an icon is not merely an image, a visual sign, but something he says more. I love that. Morgan, he often does this. He ends sentences just in like the middle of an advert. But just something more. There we are. Morgan himself has noted that something powerful to be noted, especially in the construction of the icon, whether it's Mao's portrait, it's Jesus, John Lennon, or Monroe, and one of her glamorous stills. And what Morgan points out when we look at these images is that in every case, his language, pain, suffering, and violence shape the event of the person's life and the lure he or she exerts among followers. I really agree with this. I think this is an amazing insight. And I want to add to his sense of the broader profile of the sadness in the iconic. The iconic image is almost always sad picturing a moment of extreme pain or suffering. Or alternatively, it is an image just after pain, as maybe people try to get on, to get on within suffering. When we speak of the iconic, we almost always mean something that is haunted, that is carrying something, <laughs> a tough past, a rough break, an awfulness, an endurance within difficulty. Companies that are iconic supersede bankruptcy. People that are iconic either lived in strong misery or articulated the misery of the masses or died as a result of that misery. They became ours to return to valorize precisely because they seemed to have something to show us about getting over it, getting past it, and still being here no matter what. Barack Obama is perhaps one of the few presidents to be truly conscious of his icon iconography. He was a person who became iconic even before he was elected. What is intriguing for our purposes, how hard a time he's had being a leader as he also carries his iconicity with him. Despite President Obama's repeated promise that his administration would be the most open and transparent in American history, reporters and government transparency advocates say that they have been disappointed by it, the White House's performance in improving access to the information they need. This is the most closed, control-freak administration I've ever covered, said David E. Sanger, a veteran chief, Washington correspondent of the New York Times. 
To be sure, as all of us may know, if we attracted all the Obama administrations, they have a lot to say. They're always on social media, releasing photographs, videos, having sophisticated websites to provide the public with administrative generated information about its activities, along with considerable government data useful for consumers and businesses. However, with some exceptions, such as putting the White House visitors' logs on whitehouse.gov and selected declassified documents in the new U.S. Uh, intelligence community website, most observers on either side of the aisle have felt that it discloses a remarkable less amount than previous administrations. In order to hold the administration accountable, the press lacks the information they imagine they need. Of course, White House officials object to such characterizations, citing statistics showing that Obama gave more interviews to news, entertainment, and digital media in his first four plus years than GW or Bill Clinton did in their respective first terms combined. Jay Carney, the press secretary, says, the idea that people are shutting up and not leaking the reporters is belied by the facts. I'll leave it to your own sense, and we could talk in the Q&A, uh, to think about the relationship between Obama's pre-presidential incarnation as an icon and his post-election success at practicing transparency. What I want to highlight, though, is the internal sense by the White House, backed up by tons of data, no less, that they are saying more and showing more than any other White House. And I think it's fair to imagine that Obama will be an icon in the years to come, more than Bush and Clinton, whatever their comparative leadership skills. Even if you don't like Obama as a president, you do know about his basketball games, his ferociously disciplined schedule, his relentlessly sanguine attitude. He has maintained his recognizable features even as he has remained at times incommensurable as a leader. Maybe there's something too about the sadness the sense that there's nothing ever that will really actually deeply cheer him up. Like being easy to smile is something for people who don't actually know the truth about life. Throughout his life, Graham would read the newspaper for particulars about developments that might serve as ind offering indicators of where humans stood in the unfolding of history. Signs of the times. This is a person who thought the world did not have a lot to teach him at all. The world simply revealed what the Bible predicted. At times, Wacker refers to Graham as curious, but this word is never proven. Billy seems singularly focused on repeating the same message over and over without wondering what makes people believe otherwise or live otherwise than he does. Before interviews with journalists, he also never assumed a kind of false familiarity or broke the ice with chit-chat. Interaction suggests interest in something outside yourself, outside your purpose. When Graham Graham's monomaniacal purpose was to spread only the good news. This doesn't mean that Graham wasn't interested to re represent some diversity. He'd share a dais with a Catholic or a Muslim if the moment called for it. But he didn't pretend ever to be interested in other people. And for this less engaged relationship to others, many people said he was the most charismatic man they had ever met. The most charismatic man whose memoir led reviewers to use words like monotonous and insipid to describe its contents, remarking further that the writing never rose above a genial banality. Wacker's explanation for the relationship Billy had with his public was that they simply des desired to be near this simple authoritative simplicity. Proximity to him was proximity to normative authority, Wacker concludes. He represented the right way to do things. Perhaps another way to put this is that they sought to connect to his distance from blemishes, disability, or general human weirdness. Unlike the sawdust trails that preceded him, Graham offered an evangelicalism that had no excesses and no miracles, no personal sin or disobedience. He was and is the Chevy Malibu of public figures, ubiquitous, yet hard to describe. <laughs> The worshiper effectively creates the popular icon Rupert Till has written. As members of the audience imagine themselves being or possessing a pop star, they are then embodied as larger than life characters, godlike beings, possessing the star as they consume them and become possessed themselves by the character of the star. We know that Eastern Orthodox Christians do all kinds of things with icons. They adorn them with flowers, process them, uh, process with them, held aloft bless them with water, prostrate themselves before them, and touch them and kiss them. Your use as an icon is something that is beyond your control. To be sure, you can have a relationship with your fans. Justin Bieber calls his fans the believers. Lady Gaga calls hers the little monsters. Beyonce calls her most hardcore fans the Bayhive. 
But no matter what, the key is that the fans decide who the fans are. An icon cannot make of her fans who she wants. She gets who she gets for reasons she cannot fully account. Students of religion know that the three of the major founders of religion, Jesus, Muhammad, and Buddha, all played very complex roles in the formation of their textual traditions. Jesus left no writings. All of our knowledge about him comes from followers' accounts. Likewise, though the Quran is transmitted by Muhammad, his voice is not there. We know Muhammad through Hadith, the corpus of reports on the deeds and sayings of the prophets that were recorded by his contemporaries. And the earliest known extended literary account of the life of the Buddha is dated to the first century BC, about 500 years after his estimated death. Between the Buddha's death and the first Buddha scriptures, the Buddha's speech acts were not written down, but were transmitted orally. Yet the mark of scriptural authority for Buddha's texts, sutras, is the phrase that begins them, thus did I hear which refers to the purported witnessing of those teachings by his senior disciples. In a sense, then, there is the conceit that all Buddhist scriptures are the recorded speech of the Buddha. As you might imagine, there are a lot of big hermeneutical debates about what constituted being Buddha-voiced, literally spoken by him, spoken with his sanction, inspired by his teachings as heard firsthand, inspired by teachings heard secondhand at a later date. There are those of you in this audience who give a lot of thought to this. All I want to do in this very cursory act of comparative religions is to note the way the audience becomes the alternative of the icon. You cannot control this audience. If anything, they decide who you are. And this deciding will have a lot more to do, a lot more loyalty to what they need rather than what you aspire to make for them. As Bing Crosby puts it, every man who likes me sees in me the image of himself. The Bayhive makes a great deal of Beyonce's every word and post. And as one NPR reporter would find out, they will fight ferociously to defend her right interpretation relative to the world which seeks to criticize her, misunderstand her, or question their right to protect her place on their pedestal. Scholars of celebrities still can't decide are they like us or not. And his writings on celebrity Borston wrote, we imitate them as if they were cast in a mold of greatness. Yet the celebrity is usually nothing greater than a mere publicized version of us. Much later, a journalist reflecting on Beyonce will write, the thing Beyonce doesn't understand about all the rumors surrounding her is that in the great tradition of any kind of storytelling, the thing beyond our grasp and most people's realities is her. Beyonce is the last to accept what most people think. She is not like us. Reading about Graham is more than anything a profile in white power and it's easy maneuvering through regular difficulties. At 29, Graham became the youngest college president in the nation. At the time, he held only bachelor's degrees from the Florida Bible Institute and from Wheaton College. Contemporary social psychologists would observe that this kind of endorsement of a young man with very few relevant credentials is unsurprising. There is a special kind of relationship called sponsorship in which communities advocate for the mentee. And research suggests that high potential women are over mentored and under sponsored relative to their male peers. Credentials and skills, as well as experience, are manipulated and circumvented in, in order to favor workers with certain social characteristics. The primary example of this in social psychology is when men with less experience in a particular job are hired as supervisors for it or when a young man without any advanced degrees becomes a college president. Wacker is clear that Graham is hungry for power and isn't bothered by the shortcuts or advantages he might have taken to get it. It's all just destiny. He didn't want to be enviously looking at power. He wanted to be power. After it became widely known that he engaged in a grotesquely anti-Semitic dialogue with Richard Nixon, Graham's explanation exposed his social hunger. If it wasn't on tape, I would not have believed it. I guess I was trying to please. I felt so badly about myself. This quotation is the only one in Wacker's biography that suggests fissures in Billy's confidence. The man who seems so easy in an interview, so quick to a silly quip, and so redundantly verbose to every question, suggests here that a lot of it, maybe all of it, was a performance obsessed with pleasing those for whom he performed. Hundreds, if not thousands, of publicly disseminated photographs showed presidents sitting, talking, dining, golfing with the preacher. This is Wacker's language. He praised the presidents frequently and lavishly. 
Fraternalism is rarely the result of some transparent recognition of mutuality. It is usually a desperate hold onto social superiority that may quickly be denied. The status of celebrity in the study of religion is that we tend to believe it more than we should. Like Wacker, we fall into Borston's trap, thinking renown is the same thing as knowing something. We don't just do this with people. We do this too with texts, scriptures we keep reading not really knowing why, or elders we keep quoting without figuring out whether they were really truly good to hear. We valorize circulation above other things. In this life, even as we know, we nerds especially know that what makes the best thing we've ever thought comes from not being seen, being known, but from laboring in a quiet space without any quick or obvious recourse to recognition. What I know is that most of what icons can teach leaders in a mediated age is that you are in trouble. It is hard to compete with them, with their denizens making them a site to create new sites about themselves, with two-dimensional frenzy of internet identity. But if there's anything to learn from these examples is that whatever the narrative of your leadership may be, outside of its demographic, the story will be powerfully determined by those within it. Very often we mistake mediation as a determination of frames, that the story is the thing and that the narrative is what you can control, that the surface is the surface and that you can manage surfaces and then become triumphant. But what icons teach us is that that's not so. The space between a leader and a follower, between icons and their acolytes, celebrities and their fans, is much more slippery than that. The space between leadership and those led is the space on which we ought to meditate a lot more. For icons, there is no discrimination. The fan is the fan is the fan. So often, it seems that I listen to people wishing, longing for something different in the worlds they occupy. Different students, different colleagues, different readers, broader reach. But the thing icons know is that there is no aspirational audience. Or rather, the longing for elsewhere distracts you from the weeping person in the present. Here they are, the people you serve, you teach, you extend yourself to. I use this foray into the habits of contemporary celebrity to think about what we might learn about emergent icons among them, and what those forms of iconic emergence can tell us about our capacities for leadership as scholars and nerds in the study of religion. And I want to conclude in those terms. Leaders, that is all of us, need to reboot in this time and this place, and stop worrying about gaming the system, mastering the medium, controlling the story. The only control you have is in what you hear, which is best heard when it is in front of you, and what you can present of yourself to respond to the inevitable pain and struggle and contradiction you will hear if you truly listen. Unlike an icon, a leader has a much riskier job. She has to then figure out how to speak back. But before she does, a lot more leaders could benefit from the silence of icons, from their particular genius of absorbing the world's desires, their tears, their longing into their own. At the end of his life, Billy confesses no darkness. He seems to have zero recollection of any bad days, as he told a reporter in 2006. He continues a lifelong resistance to rumination or contemplativeness. At the end of his life, Billy continues to enjoy the restful refusal of reflexivity that defined his celebrity. In his biography of Billy Graham, the great Marshall Frady remarked that when Graham spoke, America heard itself speaking to itself. As the American century has now, we must agree, definitively drawn to a close, we may look back and see Billy as representing something less joyous than the apex of evangelical expressiveness. We might instead choose to see his career, his cheery circulation, and the terms by which he read the morning paper every day, that is, looking for the mark of the beast. As Billy searches the newspaper looking for indicators, the loudest one of all may not be the bird flu or unrest in Jerusalem. It may in fact be his unconscious empire, the one that was a metonym for his country's unceasing imperial confidence. I do not know my Bible like Billy knew his, but I think I remember that the man of sin may not appear to us as an obviously slimy devil. He will, we know, arrive instead with a careening smile an easy way with people, someone who doesn't cause a lot of trouble, a message to lull us 
from our claims of difference? What if Billy was precisely not America's pastor, but instead the sign of the Armageddon we deserve for believing in him, <laughs> for listening to him, when he never valued what it might be to listen to us, to us who have so much to share. Thank you very much. I would love to talk a little bit with all of you.